Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our complimentary webinar series for US federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, DC today. You probably found out about today's webinar through our newsletter, which reaches over 23,000 federal government contractors and service providers. Today's session is complimentary and also recorded. You can find the recording on our website and YouTube channel about 24 hours after the webinar. We have over 540 complimentary webinars on our YouTube channel. This includes all 52 parts of the FAR, all 52 parts of the DFARS, and hundreds of webinars on strategic and ta tactical topics. If you'd like to advertise in our newsletter or in any of our upcoming webinars, please email us at hello at jenniferschaus.com. And a little bit about us, we are a specialized consulting firm focused on working with established federal contractors. We work with product, service, and software firms across the globe. For more information about our services, please visit our website and select About Us. As mentioned, today's webinar covering the FAR supplements is complimentary and recorded. We began this series in January 2022, and you can find these past recordings on our website, as well as the future schedule with the registration links. And as you can see here, we've already covered several of the FAR supplements, and we'll be winding down the series on August 24th with the Veterans Administration. And here's just a quick look at our Friday schedule. Um, on Fridays, we cover the same agency or department in a playbook series. And um, we discuss upcoming bidding opportunities, contracting trends, small business resources, and sometimes or oftentimes feature a government speaker. The full schedule and past recordings for our playbooks are also found on our website under the playbook tab. Please note that our summer soiree for US federal contractors has been moved from June 20th to Monday, July 18th. Again, the new date is Monday, July 18th. Anyone can register as an attendee, and we also have corporate sponsorships available. We're expecting about 100 to 200 federal contractors. The registra registration link is on our website under the events tab, or you can find it in my auto signature when I send out the recording from today's webinar. Government agencies and sponsors will be announced as they confirm. We hope to see you on Monday, July 18th. We'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors for the event on July 18th. C3 Integrated Solutions, a provider of level two CMMC certification, Insperity, White Oak, and First National Bank. And from the government side, we have confirmed attendance from HHS Health and Human Services. Please purchase your ticket on our website under the events tab. And now we'd like to thank our sponsors who make this webinar series possible. First, we'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC. Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTAX can offer. And a special thanks to the Federal Business Council. The FBC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect industry and government thought leaders, product providers, and solutions with government programs that use them. The FBC works with a variety of federal agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 plus years, FBC has become a comprehensive resource for connecting industry and the federal government. Next, we'd like to thank Dastin. Dastin is an IT and cloud solutions provider working with corporations, the military, and government agencies to lower their costs, increase scalability, improve operational efficiency, and meet compliance regulations using targeted cloud-based solutions. Dastin is a certified partner of Oracle NetSuite, a premier tier Google Cloud partner, and certified partner of Cisco, Virtue, AO Docs, and Authenticate. For more information about Dastin services or to schedule a complimentary consultation, please email Joe Alston or visit the Dastin website. Next, we'd like to thank C3. 
C3ISIT develops tailor-made technology solutions that increase efficiency, bolster productivity, and improve business processes. C3 is the leading provider of managed IT services as well as compliant cybersecurity solutions for federal contractors. C3 works with defense contractors to achieve and maintain CMMC 2.0, CFARS, and NIST 800-171. Contact C3 to learn more about the CMMC 2.0 readiness program. The contact information is on your screen. Next, we'd like to thank RLJ Financial. Founded in 2008, RLJ Financial Consultants is a customer-focused, quality-driven, minority and locally-owned provider of commercial insurance brokerage services. Their services are designed to maximize your return on investment in managing the risk to your business. Call Roderick today at 202-832-1417 for a free consultation and insurance quote. And lastly, we'd like to thank the PubK Group. The PubK Group publishes news and insights for government contractors, agency, and council. Every day, PubK delivers news on bid protests, contract disputes, new laws and regulations, cybersecurity requirements, false claims act activity, and developments in mergers and acquisitions in the GovCon community. In daily news briefs and in-depth conversations in podcasts and webinars, PubK leverages its deep bench of government contract experts to keep you up to date on fast-changing government rules and expectations. And every January, PubK presents its week-long annual review featuring more than 50 GovCon experts across a, do a dozen panels recapping the year's top developments. Part participation in CLEs are free to subscribers. Visit PubK online at www.pubkgroup.com. Thank you again to the attendees and our speaker for joining us today in our FAR Supplements series. And today we're all here to dig into the FAR Supplement on the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And our speaker today is Diana McGraw and she represents the firm Fox Rothschild LLC. Diana, it's great to have you with us. Super glad to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for taking time out to join us on this Wednesday after the 4th of July. Um, as mentioned, I'm an attorney with Fox Rothschild. And uh, for those of you that, that I haven't met or don't aren't familiar with me, um, I came from industry. I worked for a large construction company running their federal division. Uh, after doing that for several years and really kind of learning the ins and outs of, of doing federal work from the contractor perspective, I decided to go to law school and now I specialize in government contracts and construction. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into this and we're going to, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we've got a lot of parts to cover. Uh, please don't feel overwhelmed by the list of this agenda. It is two slides long. There are several, uh, you know, quite a few subparts of the HUDAR. Um, first things first, though, I think we should uh, start with just to kind of get everyone some familiarity. Um, this is a supplement to the FAR. And so for those of you, I'm sure you've watched, um, and if you haven't, there is another series uh, that was done last year um, on the federal acquisition regulations uh, put on by Jennifer. And if you look through uh, that, you can kind of get a better idea of what the FAR is, but it's the primary regulation for use by all executive agencies in their acquisition of supplies and services with appropriated funds. Uh, that FAR regulation is, is supplemented by agency. Um, and today we're gonna cover the Agency of Housing and Urban Development. Um, it's referred to as HUDAR. And we'll go through some of the important uh, provisions uh, just so you know, uh, this slide set does include every provision that's within within the HUDAR. Uh, we will gloss over some of them um, just because, you know, within one hour's time, uh, we probably won't be able to cover everything. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Uh, this is the agenda continuing. Um, and then the next slide. So before we get into the purpose of, of the HUDAR, I think what we need to do is start with um, some general context. So let's set the table for you know, why we're covering you know, this material and why is it important. Uh, first things first, federal work, it's subject to strict oversight. 
Uh, recent public statements made by the Department of Justice indicate that government funds will be subject to strict oversight in light of, especially in light of the recent global pandemic over the last two years. Uh, most recently, on February 1st of 2022, uh, there was a statement made ensuring that citizens' tax dollars are protected from fraud and abuse among the department's top priorities. Uh, this is Acting Assistant Attorney General Boynton. And he says that the False Claims Act is one of the most important tools available to the department, both to deter and to hold accountable those who seek to misuse public funds. Um, now, obviously, this presentation isn't about False Claims Act, but you do want to have a good understanding of it so that you can, you know, why these provisions are important and it's important to adhere to them. Uh, the, the False Claims Act, there are two uh, subdivisions, I would call, underneath the False Claims Act. The first is you've got the Civil False Claims Act, which is 31 U.S.C. 3729, and then you have the Criminal False Claims Act, which breaks up into just two subparts, which is False Claims, which is 18 U.S.C. 287, and False Statements, 18 U.S.C. 1001. Both cover the same types of conduct. Civil False Claims Act is the government's primary tool, but criminal investigations may be increasing over time. Remember, False Claims Act applies when even a dollar of federal money is used to fund the project. And just over the last year or so, uh, we've had the second largest recovery for False Claims Act um, in that more than 5.6 billion in settlements and judgments were received in 2021. So let's talk about specifically HUDAR. So right here on the screen, this is subpart 2401. And essentially, you know, what's the purpose? And it's it's to provide uniform department policies and procedures for the acquisition of supplies, personal property, and non-personal services. It applies to all acquisitions of personal property and non-personal services, which includes construction. It's organized in a way to help be help to be helpful to the reader. Um, it follows the same formatting, numbering system, part and subpart, and section titles as the FAR. So, you know, there's a there's a good example in in part 2401 uh, that they give you to try to highlight how they're structured. But essentially, uh, when the HUD supplements material contained in the FAR, it, they give it a unique number. Um, and if it contains the number 70 or higher, then that tells you it's a supplement. So for instance, uh, FAR 14.407, which covers uh, awards, um, you know, covers awards, and, and it doesn't identify what happens if you only receive one bid. Well, HUDAR steps in and it provides a supplement to that provision, 14.407, and it says, um, it provides you with the instruction on what's supposed to happen or how HUD is going to handle situations uh, that occur that are outside or um, are not referenced in the FAR. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Um, this next slide here, uh, this talks about the different, this is uh, deviations. Um, now, HUD is allowed to deviate from the FAR or HUDAR. Um, those deviation requests, you know, have a process uh, for them to get approval. Um, and you can read further on that on 2401.471. Um, I will go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. And here, this is the second part of HUDAR. And this is your, your section on definitions and words and terms. You know, it's it's nothing um, of a surprise. Everything here is pretty intuitive. Um, it's important to know that the head of the contracting office is the chief procurement officer. Uh, you're gonna see that name come up quite a bit as we proceed through HUDAR. So let's go on to the next slide. So the first, uh, the first substantive section that we'll cover really talks about improper business practices and personal conflicts of interest. This relates to your standard of conduct. Uh, looking at the reporting, requ reporting requirements, this supplements the FAR. Um, so the first one, let's take a look here at, um, at gratuities, subpart 2403.2. Um, for those of you that aren't as familiar uh, with this FAR section, um, it's, you know, it, it covers uh, 18 U.S.C. 201C, uh, which 
defines it essentially as the same as bribery, which is giving, offering, and promising anything of value to a public official to influence an official act, which includes tipping. Um, and I think, you know, the, the important thing that, you know, you want to, uh, when this normally comes up or when you're likely to see it happen, uh, it really comes into play when contractors are acting in an official capacity for the government. While bribery um, generally requires a quid pro quo, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, gratuities, they don't require the quid pro quo. And what the supplement here is providing is that if you have suspected violations of the gratuities clause, you have to report them to the head of the contracting agency. That's HCA. We talked about that on the last slide just a moment ago. HCA will request the Office of Inspector General to conduct any necessary investigations. And upon receipt of the OIG report, the HCA will evaluate the circumstances to determine if a violation has occurred. Similar things apply for the anti-competitive practices, which are your anti, um, these are your, uh, relate to how you are um, competing for, for work acquisition, making sure that there's a fair and equitable playing field. Additionally, this section also addresses subcontractor kickbacks. Contracting officers shall report suspected violations of anti-kickback through the head of the contracting activity to the Office of Inspector General to, for uh, consistent with the procedures for reporting any violation of the law contained in the current HUD handbook. Let's take a look at the next slide. With regards to other improper business practices, this uh, specifically refers to the Anti-Kickback Act. If you're not familiar with that, that's where contractors must have reasonable procedures in place to prevent kickbacks. You have to disclose any possible violations based on reasonable grounds to believe. Uh, this is broader than your FAR 52203-13 reporting requirements. So you must include a subcontract, you know, this, this provision is flowed down uh, from your prime contracts to your lower tier uh, subcontractors. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty standard. You're going to see this, um, you know, in most, in most, uh, in most any manner of, of, of work acquisition. And the government here is really looking for: Are you restricting the number of bidders? Is there certain bidders always bidding against each other? Is there an inadequate or missing cost or price analysis? Patterns where last bidders always get the award. A potential bidder complains about lack of notification, lack of separation between purchasing and receiving poor documentation of subcontract awards, and non-award of subcontracts to the lowest bidder. So with those anti-kickback, it's important here um, in HUDAR who that's reported to. Um, and so they've, they've identified that and they've outlined their procedures in the HUD handbook. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide and we'll move on to administrative matters. This is for uh, HUDAR part 2404. Um, essentially, what's going on here is you know, the government has, similar to contractors, everyone has a record retention requirement. Uh, looking at the government's retention requirements, in you know when they're going through the acquisition process and they receive unsuccessful cost or technical proposals, they're required to retain those copies of those proposals for a period of at least two months following contract award. Upon expiration of that period, they will retain one copy with the official contract file, and they'll ship one copy um, of each unsuccess unsuccessful bid or proposal to the Federal Record Center. Let's take a look at the next slide. Part 2405 gets into publicizing contract actions. Similar uh, in the FAR 5.201, uh, there is a requirement that you publicize and, and provide notice of all proposed contract actions available. Um, and there is a process that you have to follow to provide that notice. To, and that notice, the purpose of doing that is to really improve small business access to acquisition information and enhance competition uh, by identifying contracting and subcontracting opportunities. So the government here um, HUD in part 2405.2, uh, essentially what they require is that the senior procurement executive has to make the written determination um, 
in accordance with FAR 5.202, that advance notice of a proposed contract action is not appropriate or reasonable. So if the government decides that they're going to do something different than what the FAR requires, their senior procurement executive must put that in writing. Um, and, you know, additionally, this other section, sub part 2405.5, this just says that if they have funds, they are um, allowed to provide for paid advertisement in newspapers and trade journals to increase competitiveness um, and knowledge of upcoming opportunities. Let's take a look at the next slide. Now we're getting into the competitive requirements. And, um, and I, and I, We'll tell everyone, I know we have a lot of slides to get through today, so I am going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. That said, if I miss something or if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me after the fact. So on, uh, with regards to these uh, competitive um, competition requirements, uh, 2406.304, which is the approval of the justification, this is HUD's chief procurement officer as the head of the contracting activity. His, he can delegate the authority to the deputy chief procurement officer to approve in writing any justifications for anything other than full and open competition for proposed contracts over 13.5 million. Uh, generally speaking, uh, underneath the FAR 6.302, circumstances permitting um, other than full and open competition, it's generally uh, the government's intent to provide full and open competition unless a justification is uh, provided. Uh, the ones that are identified in 6.302, those include that there's only one responsible source, there's unusual and compelling urgency. You see that a lot in emergency contracts. Uh, there's industrial mobilization, engineering, developmental or research capability, uh, international agreement. It's authorized by or required or required by statute for purposes of national security. And then the last uh, most broad is that that which serves the public interest are all circumstances in which you can permit some competition that is other than open and full. Let's take a look at the next slide. Looking at uh, part 2407 acquisition planning, um, the FAR 7.102 essentially says that agencies have to perform acquisition planning and conduct market research. What HUDAR says is that senior procurement executive is responsible for establishing and maintaining internal control procedures, uh, you know, in accordance with, with that subpart 7.1 criteria. That criteria includes the acquisition of commercial products or commercial services to the extent that commercial products are suitable to meet the agency's needs are not available, non-developmental items to the maximum extent uh, practicable. Uh, additionally, there are selection of appropriate contract types uh, that are in accordance with FAR Part 16 and the appropriate consideration of use of pre-existing contracts, including interagency and intra-agency contracts to fulfill the, the requirement and obligation. Again, this is going to fall on the senior procurement executive to make that decision and to create that internal process and procedure. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, this is part 2408. These are the required sources of supplies and services. Looking at 2408802-70 here at the bottom of the screen, um, now, remember that dash 70 tells you that this is a contract provision that you will see uh, in your in, in any HUD uh, contract that has this requirement. Uh, what contracting officers are required to insert is a reproduction of reports. Uh, this is your standard provision uh, that limits uh, any production of written materials uh, that are to be produced uh, in accordance with the contract. It also provides some additional you know, paper information, such as the size of paper and, and things of that nature uh, when, when the production unit is, is produced. Let's take a look at the next slide. We're at FAR, uh, HUDAR part 2409. 
Uh, this is the contractor's qualifications. And we really want to focus on this first part, which is the responsible prospective contractors. Uh, for those of you that have participated in bid protests um, or or at least uh, have some familiarity with that, you, you probably have heard of the language, is someone a responsive offer war or are they a responsible um, prospective contractor? And, and the distinction here is with regards to the responsible prospective contractor, the government is trying to determine if you are awarded the work, is it highly likely that you'll be successful at performance? So here, um, Hudar is providing a little bit more color and direction uh, for the agency on how that decision is made. Um, so underneath 2409-105, the procedures, the contracting officer has to perform a financial review and will make a determination based on the information whether or not it's likely that the contractor will be able to perform. So prior to an award of a contract, what does that look like? Uh, they're going to evaluate if the contractor's on the list requiring pre-award clearance or other special clearances before award. Is the contractor listed on the consolidated list of contractors indebted to the government or otherwise known indebted to the, um, or otherwise known as indebted to the government? Uh, they're also gonna check to see if the contractor may receive government assets such as contract financing payments or government property. The contractor is experiencing performance difficulties on other work. They evaluate that obviously by taking a look at your CPARs that are in the that are in the in the in the CCAS system. The contractor um, and, and they'll evaluate whether or not the contractor is a new company or a new supplier of the item uh, to determine whether or not they have a history of being able to provide and produce on time. After award, the contracting officer would evaluate whether or not the conditions in any of uh, that we just reviewed, if any of them are applicable, or two, um, whether there's any reason to question the contractor's ability to financially perform um, and complete the contract. So those are just some important things on whether, you know, what HUD agency contracting officers are required to review in performing that financial determination. Let's take a look at the next slide. And I'm gonna gloss over this section. This refers to the organizational consultant conflicts of interest. Uh, these are your standard, uh, pretty standard provisions that you have in the FAR as well. So let's take a look at the next slide. And we're gonna, we're gonna pause here for a moment to talk about the simplified acquisition procedures. This is part 2413. And essentially, the important takeaway here is that Hudar says um, that the HUD agency transaction limits that are established by FAR 13.305-3A, they can be approved by the senior procurement executive on whether or not, um, you know, those values will be, you know, those are conditions for use. And um, so again, that senior procurement executive, he really is going to make decisions on, on whether or not they're going to go above and beyond that cap, that initial limit that's identified in FAR 13305. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Let's take a look now at sealed bidding. Uh, this is part 2414. And, and I think what's important here to note is that when you're looking at the FAR and in this section 14.408, the FAR really doesn't provide any guidance on what happens if there's only one, if it only receives one bid in response to an invitation. So, it, you know, again, we're seeing that 2414.408-70 on the screen, this is the, the second to bottom lowest you know, bullet on the page right now. And it says that if only one bid is received in response to an invitation, it can be considered and accepted if the contracting officer determines in writing that the specifications were clear, they were not too restrictive, 
there was adequate comp comp competition was solicited and it was reasonable to assume more than one bid would be submitted. The price was reasonable and the bid was in line with that with the invitation. So unlike uh, a lot of the other competitive requirements that we have at least two bids, um, HUD provides an exception to that rule and this is that, that exception. Let's take a look at the next slide. And now we're going to move on to negotiations. Uh, this is part 2415. And here, I think, let's uh, first take a look. Um, and, you know, let's start actually, let's go to the next slide. And I apologize, so let's go one more slide. There's a lot of subsections of contracting by negotiation. And, and the section I want to get to is 2414.404. And this is the cancellation of invitations after opening. So one more slide. Um, and, and so essentially, you know, let me just go ahead and, and we'll, let's just talk about it. So 2414.404 um, essentially says that invitations may be canceled and all bids rejected before award but after opening. So here, the head of the contracting agency is allowed to open up all the bids, look at everything, and then make a determination that's gonna cancel it. And that's consistent with FAR 14.404-1. Um, I also wanna just highlight 2414-407-3, this is where other mistakes um, are disclosed before award. And if you'll just, uh, I know we're flipping around here on some of the screens, so just give us just a second. And let's go to, if we can actually go to the slide that says part 2416 types of contracts. There we go. All right, there are several different types of contracts. You have cost reimbursement contracts, incentive contracts. Uh, next slide. Indefinite delivery contracts. You know, here, I think what's important to note in, in HUDAR 2416.505, the contracting officer shall be the ordering official for all task orders, but can designate an ordering official to if the orders are on a fixed price basis, and the specific prices are set forth in the contract, and there's no negotiation of order terms. However, the contracting officer cannot designate an ordering official for contracts where the prices or services are not tied to completion of the service or where discounts need to be negotiated or where adjustments or price um, or other terms are necessary. Next slide. Um, additionally, this is 2416.506. It continues onto this slide. Um, all indefinite delivery solicitations and contracts uh, the contracting officer shall insert the following clauses um, into those contract provisions. And you're going to see uh, ordering procedures, a level of effort and fee payment. You're going to see labor categories, requirements, and estimated level of effort. And those are all with indefinite delivery contracts. Um, and, and no need to like jot down all of these uh, different FAR provisions, uh, or I'm sorry, HUDAR provisions that you will see incorporated. Um, similar to the FAR, all of the, the clause language is kept in section 52. So you'll see that as the second to last section of HUDAR 2452, uh, which covers all of the different provisions. Um, it's, it's definitely a long read because every provision that can be inserted into a contract is listed there, um, but it does give you a good concept of, of what your obligations will be depending on which provisions you see in your contracts. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, part 2417, this covers special contracting methods. 
And um, similar to FAR 17204, uh, contracts must specify limits on purchase, you know, on the purchase of additional supplies or services or the overall duration of the term. Uh, generally stated terms are not to exceed five years um, unless an exception applies. And so here, 2417.204, uh, this is Hudar saying that the SVE can approve contract periods that exceed the five-year limit that's established by FAR 17.204 as long as they are not barred by statute and the contract is not an information technology contract. So those are two key points to, to kind of keep in, in your mind. Um, I know that we're seeing a lot of multiple award contracts out there. Uh, these are great vehicles. Um, because they allow the government to get someone in there performing that work pretty quickly. Let's take a look at the next slide. 2419, this is the small business program. And like you would, you know, be thinking, that, you know, that you would think you would see here, uh, Hudar has a general policy uh, to have a an OSDEBU, and for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, that's the Office of Small Business and Disadvantaged Business Utilization um, Officer or Director. And the entire uh, purpose, you know, for this person, they are responsible for the administration of the HUD Small Business Program and performing all functions and duties uh, that are prescribed by FAR 19.201. Again, um, I think if you haven't realized it yet, there is a lot of crossover between the FAR and HUDAR. And the way I like to look at it is, you know, the FAR is, is the first thing you lay down and that kind of applies to everything. And then on top of that, you'll see exceptions, you'll see additional information, you'll see supplements that are gonna be provided by HUDAR. Uh, so one of those supplements um, or, you know, is is the director, um, Ozdabu, he will have a small, he can, he or she may identify and designate small business specialists. Small business specialists, their, their primary functions are to maintain a program designed to locate capable small businesses. Uh, they're coordinating inquiries and requests for advice from, from small businesses on procurement matters. They review proposed requirements for supplies and services to ensure that uh, all small businesses will be afforded an equitable opportunity to compete. They take action to ensure the availability of adequate specifications and drawings. They review proposed procurements for possible breakout of items that are suitable for procurement from smaller businesses. They advise uh, small businesses with respect to financial assistance available underneath the existing laws and regulations out there. They also uh, ensure adequate records are maintained uh, and they report business participation in the procurement programs. They also make available to SBA copies of solicitations when requested, and they act as the liaison between the contracting officer and the appropriate SBA office in connection with any set-asides. So your small business uh, specialist is an important person. You definitely should get to know uh, within the HUD agency, depending on where you are working um, in, in the country. Let's take a look at the next slide. So here we're talking about the Small Business Administration's 8A program. And what's important for you to take away from this, like every other agency, um, HUD has entered into a partnership agreement with the SBA um, and the SBA has delegated to HUD's senior procurement executive its authority underneath 8A1A of the Small Business Act to enter into 8A prime contracts um, and it's authority underneath the Small Business Act to award that performance to those contracts to eligible 8A program participants. Uh, here, if we take a look at 2419.803-70, which you'll see it's at the middle of the slide, uh, it's important to note that to make purchases that don't exceed the simplified acquisition threshold from 8A participants, contracting officers can use FAR Part 13 and HUDAR Part 2413's procedures. 
And what that means is once an 8 to 8 contractor has been identified, the contracting officer can establish the price with them. And if the contract requires an award document, the contracting officer will prepare and issue that directly to the 8 firm with a copy to the SBA district office within five days. Really a great thing to take, you know, uh, you know, participate in are these, um, you know, if, if it falls below the simplified acquisition threshold that, that they can identify and, and sole source award these contracts. Next slide. And um, underneath, I'm just going to take, take you guys to the last bullet on this page, 2419808. For sole source, if the acquisition is made under the partnership agreement, the 8A contractor is responsible for negotiating with HUD within the time frame provided by the contracting officer, and HUD has the authority to negotiate directly with the 8A participant. So here, you know, again, there is no requirement to go through the SBA. The SBA has relinquished and delegated that obligation to HUD's HUD, and HUD will pursue and perform that. Uh, that negotiation uh, as directed. Next slide. And this is more of that process um, in the small business programming. And let's go ahead and look at the second to third, to, you know, the middle of the page there. Uh, let's talk about the competitive 8A acquisitions. Um, What's important to note is for requirements exceeding the simplified acquisition threshold, um, you know, they are also allowed to, um, are, they are processed underneath the partnership agreement. Uh, and, and the SBA here will determine the eligibility of the firm and advise the contracting officer on within two working days of the request. So unlike actions that fall underneath the simplified acquisition threshold where that obligation is delegated over to HUD, the SBA retains that requirement here, anything that is greater than the simplified acquisition threshold. Let's take a look at the next slide. We're going to now shift gears over to labor laws. And the important thing to note here, um, they provide, uh, if you're going to employ um, Underneath HUDAR 2422.14, this is employment of the handicapped. Um, in solicitation of contracts, they are required that all contractors, when they hold meetings or conferences, uh, that they will insert 2452.222-70, which is accessibility of meetings, conferences, and seminars to persons with disabilities. So you just want to make sure that the location in which you're hosting your events are ADA compliant. Next slide. Uh, part 2424, this is the protection of privacy and freedom of information. Um, essentially, uh, the privacy, individual privacy acts and uh, FOIA requests are all applicable and are implemented in HUD, in HUDAR. So let's take a look at the next slide. Trade agreement acts. Uh, it's HUD's policy to determine whether the Trade Agreement Act applies based on the total dollar estimated value of the proposed acquisition before the solicitation is issued. You'll see these provisions in, um, in your FAR clauses. If there is a Trade Agreement Act that you are expecting to see, specifically, if you are doing, um, if you're in construction and, for instance, you are looking to repair and replace a slate roof. Um, you want to make sure that you've got those trade agreement acts that are going to allow you to um, source that slate from Canada or from another um, approved country. Uh, otherwise, if you don't negotiate that on the front end and all you have is your basic Buy American Act provision, uh, you're not going to be able to implement and to implement that you know, you're, you're gonna have to, you're gonna be, you know, stuck with with Buy American. So just just be, just know that on the front end. Um, obviously, it's had the policy to determine which which TAAs should be included. But if you don't see the one you're looking for, um, it doesn't hurt to ask uh, during the RFI process uh, prior, you know, to, if whether or not it can be revised to include another TAA. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, 
Uh, part 2427, this deals with patents, data, and copyrights. Um, nothing uh, too extraordinary here, so let's take a look at the next slide. Um, underneath bonds and insurance, uh, 2428 106-6, the contracting officer will give the certified copies of the bond uh, to any person who requests it underneath FAR 28106-6. So this is just direction to HUD, the agency, that the contracting officer has this obligation. Next slide. Taking a look at taxes, uh, here, the OGC handles any tax aspects, aspects of the contracting. Um, if a problem arises, the contracting officer will make a written request asking for legal counsel assistance. Um, you know, hopefully that this isn't an issue for anyone. Um, well, let's go take a look at the next slide. As far as contract financing goes, uh, the important thing to note here is that if there is, you know, if, if the agency determines or has a suspicion that fraud is occurring, they have an obligation to report it. Um, so it's it's important to kind of, you know, be focused on that. Uh, you know, it, it you know. Clearly, you want to make sure that you're you're in compliance with your prompt payment requirements, your flow down to your lower tier subcontractors, um, and, and things of that nature. Let's take a look at the next slide. And again, you're seeing all of these subparts. None of them have a dash seven zero at the end of them. These are all directions to HUD agency and how they are to handle contract financing as it relates to non-commercial items, commercial items, and advance payments for non-commercial items. So let's take a look at the next slide. Let's look at the, the, the bottom half of the slide here. It's 2432-704-70. Um, upon receiving the contractor's, contractor's notice under clause 2452-232-72, limitation of government's obligation, the contracting officer will provide written notice to the contractor the government is either they're gonna allot the funds for continued performance or they're gonna terminate the affected contract line item. Um, or they're going to consider whether to allot additional funds uh, in doing so. So that's important for you guys to know uh, with regards to your contract funding. If it appears that there is, you know, the government has a limitation on their obligation and they are required to provide you notice of that. Next slide. Uh, another option the contracting officer has um, is to insert 2452-232-74. This is a not to exceed limitation. Um, again, uh, you know, you just want to make sure you're clear on all of these subparts that have a dash 70 or greater. These are obligations that will fall on you. Um, with regards to prompt payment, uh, looking here, the agency's head designee, for, you know, it's the SPE. And as far as HCA goes, they have the authority to make the termination prescribed in FAR 32906. But before doing so, they will consult with the appropriate payment office to make sure timely payments will be possible. And, and this is, they want to make sure that they're making payment within seven days um, underneath prompt payment. Next slide. As far as um, I think we should look at 2452-232-73, this is the constructive acceptance period. Um, if the acceptance period is going to be longer than seven days, the contracting officer has to insert that clause so that you know and are aware that payment will not occur within the seven-day window that you would normally see in prompt pay. Let's take a look at the next slide. All right, we're on to protest disputes and appeals, subpart 2433. 
you know, I think what we should focus on um, are, are obviously the two types of appeals, 2433.103, this is protest to the agency, um, and then 2433.104, these are protests to the GAO. Uh, so here, you know, with regards to appeals to the agency, let's deal with that one first. Um, protesters may request an appeal to the contracting officer's decision, decision on a protest. That request is made in writing, no, no later than 10 days. Obviously, if you want a seek a stay, you do that within five. Uh, the HCA will then consult with the Office of General Counsel and make an independent review of the contracting officer's decision requested by the protester in accordance with FAR 33103D4 and provide that protester with HCA's decision on appeal. With regards to protests to the GAO, you know, again, you still have to make these protests timely. Protests before the GAO, they are treated in the same manner as those that are filed in accordance with, uh, with the agency. Um, one thing here it's important to note is that when the contracting officer makes a determination to award a contract notwithstanding a protest as authorized under FAR 33104B, or to continue contract or performance as authorized by FAR 33104C, that determination of the intent to make an award or continue that contract performance shall be approved by HCA after consultation with the Office of General Counsel. If, if HCA decides that they're not going to comply with the GAO recommendation concerning the resolution of a protest, Prior to reporting to the Comptroller General concerning that decision, HCA, sh HCA shall obtain the concurrence of Office of General Counsel and senior procurement executives. That being said, I have rarely, rarely seen an agency not comply with the GAO recommendation. I would say 95% of the time they do. Um, however, this just goes to show you that if they're going to not comply, they do have to meet certain requirements and they do have to run this down with their Office of General Counsel and Senior Procurement Executives. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, this covers major system acquisitions. The SVE is responsible for establishing written procedures for implementing A109 and they can be found in the internal department's directives. So let's take a look at the next slide. This is construction and architect engineering contracts. For those of you that are doing A&E work, uh, what we're gonna talk about here is the evaluation boards for um, awarding these contracts. So we're gonna look at uh, 2436602-2. Um, and what's important to note is that the evaluation board has three voting members who are all uh, federal employees, one member of each board will be appointed the chairperson. Uh, you can have non-voting advisors. They generally sit for two years. Appointments are made by the assistant secretary at the headquarter level. And all board members are presumed to be familiar with the 24 CFR part zero standards of conduct regarding conflicts of interest. Let's take a look at the next slide. We're now looking at service contracts. Uh, these are um, a little bit of a different animal than a and &E contracts. Uh, the important thing to note here is that underneath uh, 2437.110, which may be on the next slide. They're all continuing here. Uh, so if you can go back to the previous slide, we're actually gonna go through all these. Um, the contracting officer is required to insert certain provisions into service contracts. And so each of these bullets that you see identified here are the different provisions. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I do want to highlight a few of them. So looking at the first bullet, um, this is 2452-237-70. This is your key personnel. Here the government, uh, the contracting officer um, they may insert this provision into solicitations where they determine it's necessary for contract and performance for the co contractor to identify key personnel. Uh, when you actually look at the language of this provision, 
you know, it says that personnel specified below are considered to be essential to the work being performed under this contract. Prior to diverting any of the specified individuals to other projects, the contractor shall notify the contracting officer reasonably in advance and shall submit justification in sufficient detail to permit the evaluation of the impact on the program. No diversion shall be made by the contract without written consent. So for those of you that are bidding contracts, you know, it's important. You, you don't want to fall into the bait and switch category. Whoever you identify, you've got to use. And if you're going to divert them somewhere else, you've got to give good justification for why you're doing that. Um, additionally, let's take a look at, there are some other provisions here that are pretty simple. Um, 2452-237-75, this is access to HUD facilities. You know, essentially, if, if your contract requires that you perform at a HUD facility, all of your employees have to possess a current PIV card. Um, they also have to go through an FBI National Criminal History fingerprint check, and uh, they have to have that card on them, that PIV card on them prior to accessing any facility. Uh, the next one, 2452-237-77, this just identifies the holidays uh, for HUD. Uh, they are the standard same ones you normally see, New Year's Day, Martin Luther King Day, Washington's Birthday, Memorial Day, Independence, Labor, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and any other day designated by federal law, executive order, or presidential proclamation, which includes Juneteenth. Juneteenth. So um, the rest of these, um, you know, are pretty, pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to highlight um, the last two. So if you'll, if you'll, the last two here, 2452-237-77. And actually, if you go to the next slide, it is dash, last two, last two on this slide, it's dash 82 and dash 83. This is access to controlled unclassified information, CUI. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with CUI, this is any information with which the loss or misuse or modification of or unauthorized access could adversely affect national interest um, or conduct of the federal pro conduct conduct of federal programs or privacy to which individuals are entitled um, underneath the Privacy Act. It's generally not available to the public. Um, so if you have CUI and during the proposal, so this is pre-award process, um, they the HUD agency can ask you to execute a non-disclosure agreement. Um, you will be required to adhere to that non-disclosure agreement during the process. And then when looking at um, 2452-237-83, it falls in line, um, however, this section applies to contracts after award. They will also require a non-disclosure act, I mean, an NDA to be executed. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, and let's take a look at the next slide. Here, let's talk about the contract administration and audit services. Um, what's important to note here is uh, this is how solicitations and contracts when the contractors are required to attend a post-award or like these are di different provisions. As you see, 2442.302-70, uh, this is direction for you, the contractor, and it says that in solicitations and contracts when the contractor will be required to attend post-award orientation conferences, the contracting officer will let you know and they will identify the date in which you have to attend and that'll be in the solicitation itself. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Uh, this is part 2444, subcontracting policies and procedures. Uh, essentially, in contracts and task orders with an estimated value exceeding $10 million, uh, you should include, include HUDAR Clause 2452-244-70. This is the consent to subcontract. So prior to use of contracting a significant portion of the work, you must get approval and consent from the government in, in performing to do so. Next slide. Part 2446, this is QA, this is quality assurance. Um, looking at that 
first section on acceptance, the contracting officer can include a clause 2452-246-70 in all of its solicitations and contracts, which identifies the acceptance period. With regards to warranties, this is pretty similar to what you're, what you're used to seeing um, in the FAR. Uh, here, you know, what HUDAR says is that the contracting officer can include essentially the same provision as FAR 52246-19. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, we're here on value engineering, and I know we're approaching the one o'clock hour, so I, I think I'm, I'm just about, you know, at the end, and I know we haven't covered it all. Um, I know there's a lot here, and I, I think the big thing I just want to leave you guys with is this. Um, while HUDA regulations are, uh, you know, can be overwhelming when looking at them, you know, reference the FAR, it's easy to find the provisions that they go with. Um, also, in addition on HUD contracts, I just want to make you aware if your contract is, you know, maybe it's not a HUD contract per se, but it has HUD funding, uh, you want to be aware and cognizant that there are Section 3 reporting requirements. Sometimes this is the largest nightmare uh, for government contractors. I know I can tell you if you're doing emergency relief work, disaster recovery, if you're working in Puerto Rico or Texas, uh, you're seeing a lot of of you know HUD funding down there, uh, it's CDBG you know block grants. These all have these report these reporting requirements that are triggered. And I just want to leave you with that if you know if you're if you're dealing with those types of contracts, you want to be aware of it. Um, you know the Section Three program requires that recipients of certain HUD financial assistance, to the greatest extent possible, provide training and employment and contracting opportunities to economic low and very low income persons. Uh, this is gender and race neutral. Um, so if, if you are working on a contract that has HUD funding, just be aware of that section three reporting requirements. Um, they, can, they can definitely be a bear at times. With that, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer and her team. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, as she said, she wasn't able to get through um, all parts of the supplement, though, um, thank you so much for such a great overview. Um, the rest of the information on her slides will be um, included um, in the link that I send out later today. Um, you can also contact Diana directly if you have further questions. Um, there's her contact information on the screen um, should you have any questions. Um, as I said, you'll be able to find the recording um, and the slides um, the PowerPoints will be on SlideShare. The recording will be on our website as well as on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours, though usually even sooner. Um, and we hope to see you all on Friday as we go through the playbook for uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. And lastly, um, don't forget to buy your tickets for our July 18th summer soiree. Um, that will be at the Kennedy Center and you can find those tickets on our website under the events tab. We hope to see you there and have a great rest of your day.